الخير هلو هلو ام هيلون هير السلام عليكم um, I want to talk about Wi-Fi and how we got to it and you know a few other things um, story starts in about 1989 I started working for a phone company uh, in Alberta in Canada and they asked me to uh, help them uh, change from first G to uh, 2G, 1G to 2G. 1G never c came into Egypt, it was analog telephones and um, you know 2G was digital telephones and uh, it was very lucky for me because uh, you know and uh, in all these things, in all great stories there is always luck you know so timing was everything um, you know so we, we got to study all the technologies that are related to the 2G and um, came up with two inventions simultaneously. One was to improve the performance. So we corrected what's called the irreducible bit error rate. Irreducible means it cannot be reduced, but we actually reduced it. And um, we did that, but it didn't work very well on real telephones. And the reason for it was that uh, the telephone itself introduces more errors, or back then, introduced more errors than the channel did. So correcting that the channel errors didn't improve the telephone's communications very much. So we, we switched to thinking, you know, is there a better technology that, than the six that were available back then? Uh, GSM, of course, was the best contender and it eventually won the day. CDMA was not as good, but Qualcomm pushed very hard for it and it eventually made it. Um, I, when I say we, it, I had a partner, another Egyptian friend of mine, uh, Dr. Michel Fatouche, and Michel is the best researcher I've ever met in my life. Um, he is very, very thorough in his work. So when we, uh, when we failed in, uh, with our first patent, um, he told me, I have a new technology that will fix all these problems. And um, I was working for a phone company and they told me, you, ca you guys keep, up, keep coming up with new inventions related to products and that's not good. So I told him, I can't do that. I can't work on it. He kept after me for six months and eventually uh, threatened me as, you know, our friendship is on the line. If you don't come to my office and listen to what I have to say, you know, I will not be your friend anymore. So I went to his office and listened and he explained to me a technology called OFDM. Uh, OFDM is the basis for um, uh, Wi-Fi and 4G. So um, I listened and I, I liked what I heard. Uh, OFDM was basically the concept of giving a single user more than one frequency at the same time. So, you know, normally you give someone, you know, like um, uh, there is a radio station 98.2, then the next one is 98.4. The communications only uses 50 kilohertz, but you leave 200 kilohertz in case the radios, you know, move around and go on top, the crystals move around and the signals overlap. So by giving someone the two channels, you immediately give you know, get four times uh, the data rate, but it actually goes to up to 10 times because of other considerations. So um, I looked at what he did and I said, well, it, you know, it's great, but it does not use some of the things that we had invented before. And the second thing was um, in very fast communications, the synchronization of the information takes time. You know, the, the, the conventionally, uh, what's called carrier and clock recovery took a lot of time. So I propose that we do things to eliminate those two elements of communications. And sure enough, we did and, um, you know, we registered it. That was in 19, we invented it in 1991 and registered it in 1992 as a patent. Um, it went very fast. We got a first office approval. Normally uh, with patents, the first office action tells you uh, for section 35, C, whatever, you know, you're uh, proposal is the, or your application is denied and they give you few re reasons uh, why it's denied. We were very surprised. This was our third patent. The first action came and said, if you remove the first seven claims, we'll give you the next 31 claims. We looked at what he gave us and said, that's great. That's a very good patent. We phoned him and said, we just need to modify the claim eight now. And he said, okay. And we got our patent. Um, the um, that was in 1990, end of 1993, beginnings of 1994. Um, the, 
uh, we learned at that time that the IEEE had started working on the 802.11 standard, which was one megabit. Um, I have to say, I mean, we went to a number of uh, venture capitalists, and I almost got kicked out of their offices. You know, they said, everybody's talking about one megabit and two megabits, and you're here talking about 40 megabits. Who, who needs 40 megabits? You know, and it was impossible to raise money for it. Um, and we had to do it from friends and family. And uh, I was lucky. I mean, at the end of the day, when we went public, uh, I owned 40% of the company, and Michelle owned 40% of the company. So it, it turned out to be good for us eventually. And uh, around, so I say in 1993, we phoned IEEE, and I talked to Vic Hayes. And he told me they're working on one megabit. So I said, you know, we're working on 40. He said, that's quite futuristic for us. So we'll meet one day. Um, and sure enough, uh, we, we built our product in 1994. We had our first OFDM units, that, uh, very much like the Wi-Fi that's used. And we started calling companies to come and see the demos. And uh, eventually, Philips came, and uh, uh, I believe National Semiconductors came. And they came and were very impressed. And um, one of the things we didn't know that uh, even though others started working with OFDM, they didn't know how to build radios. The radio was very hard to build. Uh, and for us, for some reason, it was easy. We had you know, good engineers, and we were working on it longer. So they asked us about a few tricks, and we showed them. Uh, I remember one meeting with Apple, um, and, and there was another sort of luck thing in it. Um, the day before we filed our patent, I told Michelle that we need encryption in it. And he said, no, we don't. They, this is a new technology. We don't need to encrypt it. And I said, no, we have to add encryption. And I phoned the lawyer, and behind Michelle's back, I added encryption. And uh, about six months later, I asked someone to, to repeat all Michelle's simulations. And you know, he told me it doesn't work. There are, out of all the possible frames of data, there is about 10 frames that will never make it across OFDM. And I said, yeah, I, I heard about that, something called the peak to average problem. And um, you know, I called Michelle and said, you know, the, it doesn't work. There are six frames that don't go through. And he said, oh, no, come and we compared notes. Eventually, I, we discovered he does the encryption. And the encryption is what saved the day. So um, we didn't uh, get that in our first patent. So we filed a second patent with the same priority of the first, of the first patent and included the encryption in it. That complex encryption is what makes 3G works. So um, we got credit for the complex uh, randomization of 3G, which is what makes 3G as fast as it is. Um, and eventually, we worked um, like the uh, 4G is called WiMAX. Uh, the WiMAX forum uh, had, uh, was charted by five members. I controlled three of them, YLAN, Ensemble, and uh, the OFDM forum. They were three members out of the five of the first WiMAX forum. And de facto, I was the chairman of the WiMAX forum. Um, and all the standard that's called the 802.16D or 2004, um, we basically wrote. So the 4G standard is entirely written by uh, the company YLAN. Um, we, by about 1998, the IEEE had started working on a high-speed standard and phoned. Um, I got a phone call saying that, you know, uh, your patent was mentioned in the IEEE, and you've got to come to a meeting and tell us if you are, you, you'll allow others to use your patent or not. And we had to think about it, because till that day, we were thinking it's going to be our technology and our technology alone. But we realized that there is a good uh, licensing opportunity here. So we went to, I went to the meeting, and they asked me what we will do with the patent. And I said, we will license it on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. And we filed the, those documents with IEEE, and it became a standard. Um, 2004, I believe, is when the first big sales happened in 802.11G. Uh, that was Broadcom, I believe, was leading the charge there. If Intel get, got into it later, um, I have to say, I mean, it was hard to get any um, royalties out of these companies. And when we first approached them, we were very reasonable. We were asking for something like $15 million each or something like that. And that was actually very little for this kind of technology. A company like Qualcomm charges, you know, billions. Um, they didn't respond. And Intel literally told me, the only way you will get a response from us is in court. 
I said, okay, we'll arrange that. So um, in about 2006, in end of 2006, we transformed the company from a product company to a licensing company. We basically sold all our product divisions to companies and um, hired 22 lawyers in one go and sued 25 companies and um, received over $700 million in settlements. Um, so alhamdulillah, we did very, very good for ourselves. Um, the, uh, the one case that's remaining is with Apple. Um, when we sued the 25 companies, uh, four companies carried the, the burden of the 700 million, I believe, for all of them. Uh, that was uh, Intel, Broadcom, Atheros, and another company. Um, they said, we'll indemnify everybody. But you know, to get them out of court, they had to pay us some money. Every company paid us some money so that they don't say later, you know, there was no reason for us to sue them. They can sue us for suing them. So basically, uh, everybody paid except Apple. Apple said, no, we don't plan to sue you, so you know, we don't want to pay. And we settled, OK, we don't pay. Um, the settlement, the first one, covered everything, all our patents. But when Apple uh, started, um, I think it was in the end of 2011, they introduced the 3G uh, iPhone. And they didn't know. We didn't know. They sold over, I think, 20 million or something like that in the life of the patent. It was the very last six months or year of the patent. But you know, it's built up to about 280 million in damages. So you know, for $2 million that they could have paid, they you know, left it wide open for a much bigger lawsuit. Um, and that's really the, the story there. Uh, we, you know, we did very good, I believe. Um, the very proud of uh, what we did in the sense of, you know, two Egyptians. Uh, we really studied together. Michelle and I are friends from school. Um, and we're sadly the Malik fans, so <laughs> we never had good luck. But, uh, you know, we basically got our luck in, in technology. Um, in about 2008, I uh, retired. I had started a company to commercialize patents in Canada, but came to visit Egypt in 2008. And on the way back, stayed in London for two months and then came back to Egypt and never went back to Canada since. Um, I don't know why, I just got tired. Um, and I was basically retired and enjoying my life when in about uh, March this year, I got a call from Michel that uh, he had a fight with another friend of mine, and they have a very good technology, but because of the fight, they cannot commercialize it. And they asked me if I would commercialize it for them. And basically, it's a, a Wi-Fi technology that's called HiMesh. Basically, it's a, it's a Wi-Fi router that will be able to listen to other Wi-Fi routers and talk to them. So. Basically, it spreads Wi-Fi signal from one area to another to another in a hopping manner. So, it, it, you know, it's a, you know, when you talk to communications company, it's a bit of a holy grail in wireless communications. It is going to lower the cost of communications appreciably. 3G costs about 10 units to uh, per gigabyte. Uh, 4G will cost about four units. This new technology is half a unit. So it's going to reduce the cost of communications appreciably. Now, sadly for you, you're not going to get that saving. The phone company will. <laughs> but, you know, uh, inshallah, uh, companies like Google and others are pushing with these kinds of technology to push prices down. And inshallah, they'll come down. But basically, the, uh, you know, with this technology, we, you know, uh, I decided, well, time to get out of retirement. And, you know, uh, I took back the concept of commercializing patents. Um, during my talk here in Alexandria last month, I met uh, a number of inventors. And uh, over the span of three weeks after that, I got two inventions a day. It, you know, Some people tell me I got more inventions offered to me than the Egyptian government got offered to it. So you know, and basically, they're wonderful technologies. I got um, top encryption system, top, top, uh, the highest level of encryption. I got uh, something uh, very much like the mesh of the Wi-Fi, but for uh, Bluetooth, a Bluetooth manette uh, mesh. 
which basically makes the beacon uh, adaptive. You know, you can leave your phone somewhere and it will become the beacon connecting Bluetooth devices. If you take your phone away, the fridge will take over and become the beacon. It's a very, very, you know, nice technology. Um, got an encryption system for, um, you know, before you go on taking um, files onto Google Drive or OneDrive. Of course, they don't want you to encrypt because they want it to be free for all, but, you know, uh, encrypting it is a very good idea when you're putting your family photos and you know uh, company secrets online um, m you know many many technologies uh, my two friends here who are partners with me now in, in this new company have uh, a, f a beam focusing for nuclear radiation uh, therapy so you know it's amazing the number of technologies I actually speculate that Egypt is losing anywhere from two to ten billion dollars a year on uncollected royalties, things that Egyptians invented but never registered. And if they would have registered, we would have collected that money. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really on a big drive personally, you know, with my friends and with others to, you know, get a bit have more awareness about patents and more awareness about the value of the patents, you know. And, uh, you know, we think we're doing good. Um, we, we, you know, we're um, planning a trip to Morocco and Tunis this month. Uh, we want to do make an Arab initiative out of it. Um, you know, it is really not nice to be suing companies for money. Um, they don't believe, they, I think they believe they don't owe us the money, you know. But the patent system is about that the inventor gets rewarded for his innovation. And that's what drives the world. That's what's driving innovation. Everybody gets his share, you know, and for patents to get five, six percent of a product's price is, is a very fair deal, I believe. But, you know, in any case, we, uh, you know, so we needed a partner. We, uh, I've got the top patent lawyer in the U.S., the top that's collecting, I think, about 400 million a year. He's uh, helping us. He actually believe in, believes in the cause. He believes that Arab world. i just tell you a very sad statistic. In 2010, Israel submitted 1,030 patents in the U.S. patent system. Each, uh, the Arab world altogether submitted 70 patents. So, you know, we really need to get going. Um, now, uh, Egyptians abroad are phenomenal. I mean, the top AI person in the world uh, is Egyptian, a friend of mine. Now, he used to publish about, uh, you know, predicting the stock market and stop publishing. And we all wondered, why did he stop publishing? Of course, you figure it out later, he figured it out. Why would he publish, you know, how to predict the stock market? You just predict it for yourself. And that's what he does. You know, he predicts the market for himself. And it's like Karun's money. Every, when he runs out of money, he goes and predicts the market for a week, makes some money, and leaves again, you know. And he's enjoying his life. He goes to the carnival in Rio de Janeiro. And, you know, that's all he does. Um, top uh, encryption system in the world, uh, Hanil Gamal in, in, in Stanford. You know, um, in the years 1990 to 2000, every department of communications in Canada was headed by an Egyptian. You know, like during that period when I was in my prime in, in communications in Canada, including in, I believe, um, in, in, I don't remember where in uh, Ontario, the first lady dean was an Egyptian. You know, first lady dean of engineering in Canada ever was Egyptian. So we're very strong in, in communications. We're very strong in many fields. Unfortunately, we just don't have the pooling mechanism. We don't have the tools to you know, bring our ideas together. If we did, and I'm hoping you know, we, we can start that, um, you know, we, we can change the world and we can change our own view of ourselves. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much.